And then an answer the fourth questions, and then the eighth slide is your contact and, and, and information. You know, because you would be surprised, like, uh, still get students that hand in papers without their name on it, so you don't know whose it is, so people give pitches and they don't put their contact information in. And, and then we have this thing called a pitch pack, where we couldn't think of anything better. To, to call it, but it's basically when you go in for an interview or you're pitching a stock to your portfolio manager, you want to have the annual report, the most recent 10K, 10Q, your report, a copy of your slide deck, so that they can refer to it while you're, uh, while you're giving your pitch. Because they may want to look at the balance sheet, or they may just want to you know, there may be pictures of what the company does, and that'll help them lock it into their schema and determine their, their criteria faster. And almost nobody else is going to do this last piece. So if you go in and they interview people from around the city or other schools, and you actually bring them this information in addition to your pitch, you're going to distinguish yourself right away. And whether they want it or not, they're going to stop and say the person was very thoughtful of saying, there's additional information you may want. Print out the most recent financials or the most important headlines and give that to them so they don't have to go look it up. Uh, if you sent it to them in the mail, don't assume they remember where it is when the day of the interview. Bring another copy with you. And yeah, we're killing trees, which is, I guess, unfortunate and all this, but you do want to make it as easy as possible for the portfolio managers. They're overwhelmed with information, overwhelmed with demands on their time. And they're really protecting that <clears throat> time. And that's it. So what we would encourage you to do is, uh, oh, do you want to send the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Um, if people want copies of the slide, we're going to hand this out, name, and your email address. We'll probably also attach a survey. It just gives us feedback. And um, we'll probably add you to our email list as well. So if we're going to spam you. Yeah. And, and then if you don't want to be on it, just we, we don't send that, that many emails out. Just, uh, uh, but anybody yeah. gives us their email address, we'll give you a copy of the presentation. Um, and that's it. Any questions? Oh, I guess if anybody has to leave. You know. Yeah, you can talk. Yeah. If you have to run off to anything, please. You look like you're about to ask me. Like oh, yeah. yeah, so uh, the catalyst, what would you say is like the most common thing besides time? What's, what's I think the, time is the most common thing. What would be the most common besides time? New information is almost always the most important. And we don't, we don't go, we didn't have time to go through it today. We talk a lot about in the book how these prices are formed, the mechanism that happens. And if you think about it, the consensus has a set of expectations. What's gonna be the most powerful thing to get those expectations to start to move? Almost always new information. So I'd say time first for most companies. The company just performs and people wake up and say, wait, this is a better company than we thought. The opportunity is bigger than we thought. The financial would be better than we thought. That's the most common. The next would be just incremental information. And then the third is some sort of giant end. Oh, I'm off camera. <laughs> then the third piece would be uh, just the market starts to realize they're wrong. But it's the catalyst being that one. But what I would guarantee, if you go in for a stock pitch, if you talk about the mispricing and don't talk about the catalyst, you'll have a lot more success than if you talk about the catalyst and don't talk about the mispricing. Sure. So, and cat, cat, catalyst, it's, it's... Controversial topic. Yeah, because it's... The, and, and if you get the mispricing right, the catalyst will be in there. Sort of obvious, right? What's going to cause a mispricing correct? But good question. I, and Wall Street people are all over the place. A friend of mine ran a fund for a long time called the Non-Catalyst Fund because he was anti-catalyst. I would explain to him that, well, why does the stock price change? It just does. I said, well, that's a catalyst. A catalyst is anything that gets the consensus to start to move towards your view or towards a new view. Yes. Um, so sometimes the portfolio manager is really feeling that fixated on the best idea. So, I mean, this is from my personal experience, I got the question that, is this the best <coughs> company out there in this industry? So, how do you suggest Well, that? there's a difference between the best company in the industry and the best idea. So which... So flesh that out. Yeah. I mean, you flesh it out. What's the difference between... 
For cost, does Guy want the best company in the industry or your best idea? Like the best no, company in the industry may not be a good investment. You might explain the difference. Yeah. So what he means is it's the best in way to play the industry. I assume that's what? Um, so it was more like a winner uh, across the entire. All right. My response, we're going to have different responses. My response would be, you need more information on this criteria. So you wrote a book on Gorilla Games. Right. I would argue that you, he, he or she is not giving you the criteria they're looking for. They're being very vague. Because they say, they'll say, is this the best? The best what? Will I make the most money? Or is this the safest way to make money? Is this the company most exposed to the trends you're identifying which are mispriced? And effectively, it's a criteria. I think it's a criteria problem. Now, that's a bit of a problem for you because a lot of times they're not going to tell you more. But you need to, I will argue, you're going to have to flesh that out and ask in a nice way. Portfolio managers are stubborn. I was one for a long time. They're stubborn. They don't want to answer that question. But you've got to get behind the question because, as Paul said, there's a big difference between the best company, the best idea, and maybe it's some combination of the best company with a pretty good return but safer or perceived safer. So you have to dig more. And I hate to punt the question because I feel like I'm not giving you an answer, but you got to get more criteria. So, so I could follow up, like how do you how do you extract information on the criteria part where it's not available? Yeah, I think this is a very important question. The question of how do you extract this, is I, I, that's a piece we don't address specifically here. We talk a lot about it in the book, but we have to limit it. So I do want to riff on it for a moment. Um, and you have a couple problems. In what situation? If you're an employee in the organization, then I think what you want to do is watch, observe, ask lots of questions, see what they buy, see what they don't buy, see what they reject, see what they own, see what they respond to other analysts. And I would literally keep a dossier on every portfolio. See, manager. outside the organization, all that you can see is what's in the portfolio or what they've bought. What you can't see, which is much more valuable, is what they pass on. And that, if, if you look at stuff that, if you look at what they buy, but more importantly, focus on what they don't buy and why they don't buy it. Internally, you yeah, can do that. You'll be able to figure out the portfolio manager schema a lot faster. <coughs> but that's how you keep the dossier. Now, let's go back. You're in an interview. I don't think you're ever figured out. And I think that's part of the problem with these interviews is you're going to, you have to have an idea. If you go with an idea, you're going to have to have a somewhat generic idea. If you meet with some guy who's more interested in distress sort of situation, somebody else more interested in growthy sort of situation. You can go to these different interviews, and that's the problem. Everyone has a very specific set of criteria they're looking for, and you go in with an idea, and it doesn't. It's not even close. They sort of close down, even though you've done a lot of work, and it maybe is a great idea. That's a great. Idea. Now, stock picking hunts, I think, are impossible because I don't think the judges have any idea what their criteria. Are. But I will tell you, as a generic, if you follow our approach, you're going to distinguish yourself from the other students, for sure. You well, we've been say. judges on stock pitching contests, and I can tell you, it. Uh, well, we came up with those four questions for a reason, because like, we'll be sit sitting at the contest, they'll say, stock is 40, I think it's worth 45. You're like, next. Okay, next. And then, next you question. Know, that's the... Uh, Sometimes fund managers tend to be very emotional about uh, the stocks they hold. Probably they would have made money or somehow they stayed away from the stocks and they did not lose money. So they have they look at stocks in a particular way. And so how should we pitch the stocks in case we have a completely opposite idea? Yeah, it, it's, it's a cousin of this question to some degree, which is it's a criteria problem. So um, what was it? Got us okay. to say toy company? Yeah, so, so, so Sandy Gottesman, He's on the board of Berkshire, Berkshire Hathaway, so I work for him. And he said, I'm going to give you a gun, and you're going to put it in your desk. And if I ever come to you wanting to buy a toy company, I want you to take the gun out and shoot me. That's reasonably emotional about an idea. <laughs> right? I, I, I used to say things, I hate certain things, and we are human, and it's going to happen. I, you have to avoid those in those situations. Well, well you don't pitch a stock that doesn't fit the portfolio manager's criteria. And now, sometimes they have negative criteria. Like Meryl Whitmer, she has this joke that she will never buy a company that the CEO has a mustache. And she has an anti-mustache rule. So they're showing up CEO has a mustache, might, she might close down. So I, yes, that's the whole point. We keep saying you've got to understand that criteria. Some of it's irrational. 
question. Uh, most of the analysis you presented today are for buy side uh, interview or how to step pitch a stock. But I was just wondering if you, in your in your knowledge, do you have any difference? Do you think if you have to pitch a story to a sell side, somebody working on the sell side, for example, if you interview the sell side, and about like a specific range of stock that they present you with. For example, they ask you like, could you analyze this company at tender recommendation? It's exactly the same. But it, like, like it works for private equity, it works for real yeah. estate. Hold on a second. I, I, I think that I was a sales analyst for 20 years, so I, I was tell you I think there's a subtlety to your question. I think the emphasis in that interview is going to be can you figure the company out? More on the analytics, less on the recommendation. Uh, so I would advise you to think about this, but it's going to be more of trying to just the mechanics, the value drivers. So if they say, go, we're going to give you three weeks to go analyze the, the chemical industry and give us a thought on, on Dow or, or DuPont or something like that, I think what they're really asking you, can you come back with a, a thesis on what the value drivers are more than necessarily why the stock is mispriced. So I would focus more kind of on that variant perspective, how are you the value drivers, um, showing that you've taken the balance sheet and the income statement apart, you've done the revenue breakout, and you say, look, 60% is base chemicals, which is going to be driven by industrial production, 40% is special. Just showing them that you've done the analytics behind it. You understand what the value drivers are, and you have some view on those analytics. So a subset of. Uh, if you have to pitch, now you have to think about what they're looking for. It's a little different than this. But as Paul said, I, I've given this presentation to private equity, venture capital, um, private equity, venture capital, and we can do it in real estate, and we'll show you it maps almost perfectly. There's one subtlety to it. In those cases, there is no public price after you purchase it. So there's less of this, the, the notion of a catalyst. The catalyst is you develop, you, your influence on the under, underlying value of the asset. So in venture capital, you may influence management team or where they invest their R&D, private equity, operational, financial stuff. So you're affecting the value over time, whereas in the public markets, you care is what the consensus view towards that is. That's the only subtlety. But it maps pretty well. But I think on the sell side, they're really, can you do the job, which is analyze companies. Yes? Um, this is maybe separate from this presentation. I just want to get a brief view from you in terms of the fundamental research by human beings. Paul and I. That's not a good Paul, question to ask me. <laughs> Paul, Paul and I. This is one of our. Paul and I have been working together for four years, and we talk every day, virtually every day. It's like the wife you never knew you had. <laughs> Both ways, by the way. I'm now walking the park to have fun. Uh, one of the topics we talk about, we have several that we debate, is this notion. And now you have to tease it apart for a second. There is passive investment, which is really indexing. It's been going on a long time. A lot of people throw up their hands and say, the active managers aren't outperforming, I'm paying higher fees, screw it, I'm just going to mimic the market. And that's about a third of the market today. We can have great debates how far that go. It can't go to 100% for a lot of reasons. There'd be no trading. I mean, everybody would, but. Then you have quant investors, which historically have been arbitrage related. They're looking for mispricing in cross markets, mispricing across trading over time. They're looking for imbalances. That's really the quants have done. Okay, all oh, that's fine. Robo investing, I will argue, is just quant on top of the market. The piece that you want to think about is machine learning AI in terms of doing the fundamental analytics of trying to figure out what these things are worth. Now, at the end of the day, you're buying from humans and you're selling to humans. Maybe you're selling to another AI machine, but ultimately we're human. So there is an element of understanding what other people are going to think. So let's push that aside. That's going to be fascinating to watch. And uh, it has some weird recursive implications on itself. But I think that's the piece that we have no idea. Now, Paul will then say, and I'll set him up for this, is because the, you have all these Influences. You have quants analyzing the market from a statistical perspective. You have index, which is just replicating the index. Uh, you have what is called the listing gap, which you'll talk about. You've set it up so that the only people left in the market are phenomenally well trained. We know these people, you know them all. They are very focused, exceptionally bright, hardworking, and huge incentives. And that's who you're trading with. So when they sell you a stock, right, one of you is probably going to be wrong. 
you better understand why they're selling the stock. Yeah, and I'll give you an example, a very quick example of that. Okay, so there's a company called RS Metrics, and what they do is they fly a satellite over the United States like six times a day, or what, however often they do. And the satellite takes pictures of all of the Best Buy parking lots and all the Chipotle and the Home Depot and all of the diff different stores. And then they have a computer program, and the computer program counts all of the, all of how, how many cars are in the parking lots. And then they compare that versus a month ago, a week ago, a year ago, or what, whatever the unit is. Now, if I'm an analyst on Best Buy, and I don't have access to that data, I'm paranoid. Because what will happen is the stock will start to go down. I'll call up the CEO, ask if anything's going on. He'll say no. And that's assuming that everything that he's telling me is, you know, it's not uh, material.